Thank you for those who are coming today and um, planning to attend uh, today's sessions and for those who are staying here and have been enjoying yesterday's sessions. I hope that you will be staying all the way until the end. Um, today, we are going to have Ibu Mulaika Hijaz as the co-managing editor of Indonesia and Malay World uh, to present her topic, Publishing in International Journals, the peer review processes. And after uh, <coughs> Ibu Mulaika's session, we, have, we are going to have a coffee break. And then the rest of the day, until Friday prayer and after that until 3 o'clock we are going to have individual session which means that um, you can consult your work with Ibu Mulaika or Pak Maitri or also working by your own. Okay, I will invite you to speak up. Thank you. Selamat pagi semua dan terima kasih kerana mengundang saya ke PKN. Saya sangat senang berada di sini. Tetapi saya minta maaf terlebih dahulu untuk uh, penggunaan bahasa Indonesia saya kerana tidak begitu uh, ya, pada tahap yang sesuai sebenarnya saya orang Kuala Lumpur tapi saya selalu membuat kesalahan dalam bahasa Indonesia mungkin lebih baik jika saya menukar kepada bahasa Inggeris tapi saya memang sangat uh, saya, saya faham kesulitan yang menghadapi anda semua iaitu menulis artikel dalam jurnal antarabangsa dalam bahasa Inggeris sedangkan saya sendiri mengalami kesulitan untuk memberi uh, ucapan formal dalam bahasa Indonesia atau bahasa Melayu. So itu sesuatu yang sangat yang sangat susah dan tidak begitu adil saya, saya faham. Uh, tetapi itu memang uh, keadaan yang yang menghadapi uh, kita semua. Okay, so I'm going to, I, 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 sorry I'm going to do it in, in English. Uh, nanti Pak Menteri pun rasa ke kesepian ya kalau <laughs> saya tidak menggunakan bahasa Inggeris. Yeah. What? <laughs> it's, it's, it's South Asian politeness, you know. Um, okay, so what I'm going to talk about is is the process of peer review um, at uh, specifically at Indonesia and the Malay World, which is the journal that I'm the co-managing editor of now. Um, I I believe a lot of this can uh, apply to other journals, but I haven't worked at them. However, I have also um, submitted my own work to other journals, and so on. Uh, speak a, a little bit. So I guess my experience is, is informed not just by being the editor and managing the peer review, but also by being in the receiving end of, of, of peer review comments and you know how challenging that, that can be at times. So what I'm going to do is maybe speak for about half an hour um, and then I have invited Dr. Al-Makin from Udin uh, just to speak today. Um, for about you know ten minutes, uh, because we have recently published, um, and it, I saw it; it's been published online, so I was very happy to see that. Uh, so we've recently published this article in Indonesia and the Malay World, and I thought it would be helpful for him to give his perspective as an author, because you know it's one thing for me to tell you, um, you know, the process is like this and this is what happens, but it's another thing to to be you know the, the author in, in the process. Um, and so hopefully at the end we'll have uh, time for questions, but if you know people have things that they want to ask as, as we go along, then that's fine too. Okay, so a little bit about um, the journal, and I have a, a couple of copies here if, if people want to look at them, maybe I can pass them around. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, it has a slightly strange title, I know, especially for Indonesians, you know, what is? Well, but um, basically, it, it's trying to um, so you know it's area studies, but it's a Southeast Asian, insular Southeast Asia. Uh, you know, so it's kind of a strange remit. So, so not the Christianized Philippines, but the the it's not always been that. Southern Philippines is okay, and Southern Thailand is okay, but not all the time. Um, and uh, it, it was previously called Indonesia Circle and ran for a number of well, decades. Um, so we're now uh, managed by Taylor and Francis, which as you may know is an enormous publishing conglomerate. And there was issues about that, which we can, which we can talk about if, if you're interested. Um, but yeah, so I'll try to, to, to speak a little bit about how these journals are, are managed, just so that you get you know, some idea. 
And basically, as I guess is common with all academic journals, you know, it's run by academics at whatever time they have. Um, we have a, a, my co-managing editor does the copy editing, Pauline Cohn, um, and uh, we have someone who manages peer review, Dr. Laura Gosloffy, and they are paid a little bit, <laughs> a little bit, um, out of our revenue, out of the. Um, for the, uh, the money that we get from Taylor and Francis, but this is really not, you know, this is all run on a complete shoestring. Um, and then this, in, this enormous publishing giant is kind of doing the packaging and the marketing and the survey and, and all of this. And, and you know, this is, this is, these are ongoing issues for academic journals, whether this is a model that we want to do at the moment we're sort of trapped in it for various reasons. Um, I mean, I guess one of the things that is problematic for me, and especially you know, thinking about scholars in Southeast Asia, is that this is all behind a paywall. Uh, if your institution has a subscription, then that's great, but this subscription is very expensive. Um, it would be wonderful if we could be like Midrachen and be free, um, but our funding structure does, does not, at the present time, allow that. Um, okay, so. I want to, okay, so I should say also, so, so what we publish is humanities, basically. Um, the literature, history, um, anthropology, you can look at the titles up there and you get kind of an, an, an idea of the, the kind of things that we publish. We come, I mean, it's a, it was originally a SOAS journal, so it's very much rooted in the so, sort of SOAS commitment to, or the commitment that we had to uh, studying languages and literatures. So I think for many of us who work on the journal, the whole point of doing it is to keep a publication outlet for people working on you know, languages and literatures of the region. Because there are, certainly in, in the Western English, there are vanishingly few such outlets. Um, so that's kind of the stuff. I mean, we cover all kinds of things, not um, sort of um, social science, technical disciplines, we don't publish in economics, um, we don't publish very much on linguistics, we have recently, but we have had some issues there. Okay, so just to highlight um, some recent articles by uh, authors at Southeast Asian Higher Education Institute, um, so we have the article by Ba'a Makin, who, who's here, who's just uh, it's just been published online. It won't appear in print until next year, but I will speak a little bit about how that online publishing process works. So, you know, if it's important to, to you that the article gets out very soon, but we don't have a free issue for a year or two years or something like that, then we can publish it online. And then, you know, usually, as far as I understand it, for the administrative purposes, then that's, that's good enough. Um, so that means you don't have to hang around waiting for, for the general issue slot to come up. Uh, so a couple of other um, things, uh, other, other articles um, recently. Um, so a few jointly authored things, and uh, Marjorie was talking yesterday about maybe thinking about doing joint authorship um, with people with sort of different uh, sort of joint affiliations, I guess. Um, but that sort of gives you an idea of the kind of, of stuff that we Publish. Um, okay, so peer review. Um, this is all probably going to be very um, obvious to you, but basically, you get two independent reviews that don't know about each other uh, and they don't know who the author is. And the author doesn't know who they are. Now, this is the idea, right? Uh, so, now, in this small field, you possibly will have a good guess about, or you might know, you know, it might be very obvious who your peer reviewer is, and they're gonna know exactly who you are, so it's just a, so the anonymity is, I mean, we certainly, we all preserve, you know, the fiction of anonymity, and we don't tell anybody who anybody is, but you can often have a very good guess. Um, I mean, this is, so it's a very um, sort of delicate process. Uh, and we try as far as we are able to find the best reviewer for your article, but it sometimes can be very 
difficult because, well, the best person may be too busy, um, or there may be other issues, or maybe um, you may be, um, you know, demolishing the argument of the of the, of the other main person you feel, which is fine, but it's probably not a good idea to have them review it. Um, so, you know, a lot of our time is spent finding the person to identifying the right person, persuading them to do it, chasing them, getting the review, and then screening the review. We do not just send them out without looking at them because you've got to make sure that they are good reviews, I mean, by which I mean, you know, reasonable, useful feedback and, you know, and which can be passed on to the author. And this is not always the case. Um, we are having a lot of trouble now, or, or increasing trouble finding reviewers. People are busier and busier. It takes longer and longer. I think there's actually, I hear there's a lot of resentment about the way the publishing structure of these things. So yeah, you know, the perception, which is probably true, is that you know academics do lots of free labor, and the publishing company makes a lot of money. And what's the benefit for us? Uh, and, and you know this is this is a big issue for us at the moment. Um, so this is all my way of saying why does it, my way of explaining why does it take so long? You know you submit your article, and we usually would tell you right away, okay, we've received it, we will send it out for review. Okay, you might have found the reviewers within a week or two, or you've just decided who they should be. Then it takes them a while to get back to you. Then they say, yeah, I can't do it now. I can do it next month. I mean, this thing can crank on and on and on. Um, so it, it does, or you know, you get the review and you realize, well, this person is, this is not a very suitable review. And I, you know, we may have to again. Or in the second bullet point, we, we get two reviews and they are vastly different. One person says, well, this is great, published for minor corrections, this is all fine. The other person says, well, this is really no business publishing anything like this. Then we have to find another reviewer to, to, to do another independent review or to review both of them and say, well, what, what should we do here? So this process can take a very long time. Um, or it, sometimes it can go quite quickly. It just really depends on factors that are mostly out of our control. Um, but what's the point of peer review? So this is supposed to be allegedly, you know, the kind of gold standard of, of academic publishing. Well, the point of it is to keep out stuff that is <coughs> bad or fraudulent. Well, fraudulent is probably the, the, the ultimate nightmare for an academic editor, is that you kind of get, oh, so, I mean, some of you may have, have heard about this recent sort of, uh, uh, scandal in academic publishing about uh, this article that was published in Third World Quarterly. And Third World Quarterly is, uh, was started by Abu Saeed, I think, or you know, it's one of the founding uh, members of the editorial board, and the whole point of it was to put forward a third world perspective. So they, for reasons that remain opaque, I think, they published a article called The Case for Colonialism, which is not an ironic, you know, thing. It is actually an argument in favor of colonialism. So this goes against everything that the journal stands for. And also is allegedly a very bad article. So, um, and it seems like it, it was peer reviewed, rejected, and then they re, they published it as an opinion piece. And I have no idea why an academic journal is publishing an opinion piece, but yeah, so, so these are the things that shouldn't happen, right? And they have got in massive trouble for this, and I think it's been retracted, has it? Um, so peer review is supposed to stop you from doing it, and the entire editorial board resigned. So th these are the only kind of checks that we have on, I don't know, I don't know what this was, editor gone crazy or something, um, or he really wanted uh, clickbait. I, have, I mean, <laughs> I really do not know. Um, of course, there are other uh, more, more, well, no. I mean, the, the, the Lancet one is more serious. So these are, um, you might have heard of, of, of some either of these. Uh, you know, obviously this is 
not obviously, but uh, in, in cases of, of scientific journals and medical journals, you know, the, the consequences can be life or death, really. So the very famous case of Andrew Wakefield in, in The Lancet, you know, one of the most prestigious medical journals in the world, uh, he managed to publish a completely rubbish paper that, um, which passed peer review, which uh, alleged that, you know, the MMR vaccine caused um, autism. And this then led to people refusing the vaccine and children dying. So that was, you know, and they only retracted the paper in 2010. So there are a lot of um, problems. So this shouldn't, and then it turned out that his, his work was actually completely fraudulent and it, um, it sort of uh, broke the, um, what did he do? I mean, he paid, he paid his subjects and things like that. He didn't have ethical consent. So it was, so, which was why they retracted it, not because it was wrong, I think, if I understand it correctly. Uh, there was also a, a sort of famous prank that the 90s, in the sort of 90s culture wars in the States, uh, where a physicist, theoretical physicist, published an article in Social Text, which is a very you know, cutting edge critical theory journal. He published an article, he, he sent them an article saying that physics is an ideological construct, and they published it. And this was, you know, well, I mean, he meant it to be totally humiliating, but I think they kind of styled it out a little bit. I think they just were like, yeah, it's a, but you know, these are the things that as an editor, you really do not ever want to have to deal with. Um, fortunately, I think that in our field, we maybe don't have these, hopefully, uh, kinds of issues, but this is that the idea of peer review anyway is that you catch things and that what you do publish is has been judged by at least two of your peers to be worthy of publication. Um, okay, so just, um, you know, this is, again, I, I'm sure all of you are familiar with this. So the way we do it is that there are three possible um, decisions that you'll get, oh, so each reviewer can will come to what has to choose one of these. And, and my tree was talking about doing it slightly differently, which I thought was interesting. So yeah, uh, maybe there are ways that we can, we can improve it. So either you get accept, um, usually with you know some queries or corrections. You know, I, I don't think it's bad, very, very unlikely that there will be no queries and no points. You know, um, it doesn't, very unlikely that it's got sales. I don't know some people who are so print ready that it kind of almost does that. So yeah, it's possible. Um, revise and resubmit is a difficult one because this means that the correction, like there, there is merit in the article, but major corrections need to be made and it is reviewed again. So there's no guarantee that if you do the corrections, you're automatically going to be published. You do the corrections and then we look at it again. Um, and I think that's where Mitra, you were going to do something a little bit. It, it will vary from case to case. Yeah. Yeah. We're thinking about if it's actually almost there, but requires certain amounts of stuff, revision. We'll, we'll, we'll differentiate between the type of revision. We may actually say accept with revision, um, or just revise resubmit. So we're, we're trying to add a little bit more. Uh, I wonder whether that just sounds nice. <laughs> it <laughs> sounds, know, sounds nice. Yeah. So that yeah. they don't send it somewhere else. I guess I have seen some where they're given the, there's told revise and resubmit, they're given the corrections, then they go and do something else and then give it to you. And so then we go, we go around again. Um, or um, flat out uh, rejection. I should say, well, I have a little chart that I stole from somewhere. Um, it, not every article goes to peer review. If they come in and usually what happens is, is uh, my colleague who handles the peer review gives it a quick look over. If it's obviously not going to go through peer, not good enough to be peer, because we also don't, we don't send everything out to peer review. There's too much and we will greatly irritate our peer reviewers if we send them very bad papers. <laughs> um, actually, sometimes we send them things that we think is kind of okay and they're like, yeah, how can you send me this? <laughs> 
so yeah, so we some are weeded out right at the beginning. Um, usually, um, the Dr. Nozopi will consult myself or other members of the editorial board. You know, take a really quick look at it. What do you think? Should we should we review it or not? Um, or, and sometimes in that case, it's not that it's a bad paper, but it's um, you know on a topic that we don't publish on, or you know some, somehow it's outside the remit. And then so that we can just quickly say, actually, you should try this other journal or you know something like that, and then we can speed it along. Because the one of the worst things about this process is that you wait, and you wait, and you wait, and then they say no, you know, which is it's just very frustrating. Um, so yeah, so what happens? Well, that's kind of there. So we might just send it back immediately, or we send out to peer review, we get the reviews, and then we have to look at them, collate them, uh, sometimes moderate them a little bit, uh, and then send back the reviews, and then we get, hopefully, the author does the revisions that are, requ that are requested, uh, and then we accept the paper. But that is not the end. Oh, it's only the beginning. Um, so, okay, so what happens in revising this bit? Um, yeah, so you're, you're asked to revise on the basis of the, of the reviewer's comments, um, but if you do that, it's not automatic, because you might think you've done that, but they might think you haven't done it. Um, so it has to be reviewed again. And then the other thing I think is very important to emphasize is that these are recommendations, they're not, yeah, they're not orders. I mean, these two different people, and they may be different. They, reviewer one may tell you you need to do this and this, and reviewer two will say, no, actually you need to do other things. So then you as the author, you get this and you think, but I can't possibly do both of these things because they're going in opposite directions. Um, so we don't expect that you do both of those things. Um, we do expect that you take it seriously. I mean, you read the comments, you think about them, and then think, okay, what am I going to do? Which ones can I take on? Uh, which ones do I think are you know, unnecessary, or they're, you know, they're gonna make it, this is not what I'm trying to do. Um, so you don't have to do anything, but you do have to take it on board, or to sort of take into consideration the serious consideration. Um, so I will show you an example, not that one, so, yeah, so of, of responding to reviewers. So uh, my very favorite authors will send, uh, and we do ask people to do this, um, to send a list in response uh, to the comments saying, if, you know, if they get rebuffed, you know, uh, the major correction or something like that, to say, well, what we've done is, actually, this article, say, it was accepted minor revision, but both the reviewers had quite long um, lists of, you know, have you thought about this, and what about, you know, very detailed. So the, the authors sent back a document saying, in response to reviewer one's comment here, we did this. In response to reviewer two, well, we thought about doing this, but we couldn't do it, so we're not going to, you know, so, and it's beyond the remit of the study, so we're not going to do it. You know, so for instance, you can see, um, yeah, so, so, you know, we comment on the more substantial changes in the order they occurred. We took on board reviewer two's comment. Uh, you know, reviewer two asked us to go and find another map. We found another map. I mean, they, these people were very, very diligent. I was so like, happy with them. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be in such detail, but I guess the, the main point is that you do need to sort of take on, take into consideration what they have uh, recommended, and if you're going to reject it, you have to say why you're going to reject it, and that could be fine. You know, when we're not going to say we've well, got to follow everything. Everybody said, I mean, it's impossible usually. Um, but we would like to see that you took on board, you know, something, or you, took, you thought about it seriously and just kind of think, well, what do they know? Um, I mean, it's very tempting to do that, right? You get this massive list of corrections and you think, ah, 
so, but, so I guess the, the thing is that, you know, these are people who, we, we try to have people review it. And, and the reason they do review it is because they care about the field, and they, in the ideal case, they want, to, they want your paper to be published, but they want it to be better, or whatever it is. So, you know, it is an opportunity to, um, you know, make serious improvements. Uh, so, we also try to have people, um, uh, you know, we, tr we try not to let sort of uh, nasty comments go through, or, you know, personal things, or uh, too much, uh, they didn't, the reviewer one saying, why didn't they cite me, reviewer one, a hundred times, uh, which sometimes you do get that. Uh, so we try to moderate all that kind of stuff, and people who do that, we don't ask them to review, but then the pool gets smaller and smaller, so those are all sort of things we have to um, kind of juggle. Um, and we can talk maybe in the questions or, or later about this whole process of, of dealing with the responses. I mean, I know this, as, as an author, this is one of the most Unpleasant, or, or so, not necessarily unpleasant, but the, the, you you anticipate it with some apprehension, I guess, getting the reviews, right? You go file, and like, oh. uh, so yes, so I, I mean, it is a sort of challenging process, but it can be helpful, um, you know. And, and yeah, so hope in the best case, we want people to be giving comments. And for the author to be thinking, okay, yes, this person understands what I'm trying to do. They're trying to make it better. I see if I use this and this that they've suggested it could it could be better, and then it can be all nice and win-win all around. Um, so we don't always get there, but we try. Um, of course, we have some fun things. I don't know if you know about this Twitter feed, Lego Academics. It's very funny. Uh, it's about women in science. There was a Lego set of um, paleontologists, I think. Uh, and that, so anyway, these academics have this very funny Twitter feed about them. So, you know, you can get comments like, uh, Dr. Gray's paper, evidence is an inadequate understanding of the important work of Dr. Gray. Mm -hmm. And I have seen this in peer review of, uh, and this is very embarrassing for, well, I mean, I, actually I think this is when it's working. Uh, although the author usually doesn't appreciate it very much, right? So you get uh, a report on author A, and the reviewer says, but this is not as good as the work of author A, they really should look at author A, and you're like, oops. Uh, but it shows that your reviewer knows the field, knows what's good, and sadly your paper in this case is not as good as your last paper, or something like that, which is, you know, which is difficult, but at least they, they knew about your last paper, and they thought it was really good. But yeah, that, that one we had to, I think we edited it out in the comments, we're like, yeah, yeah, maybe. No, uh, maybe they don't. The person doesn't need to know that. Um, okay, so in the very happy uh, and wonderful event that it is accepted, uh, and this is, I mean, this is wonderful for all, all of us. I mean, we as the editors are looking to publish your papers. Um, we are really, we really want good articles to publish, and we are very happy when we, when we get them. Um, so it's not that we're trying to get rid of, you know, everyone and tell everyone to go away. I mean, we, we, we're very happy to publish your papers, but, you know, it needs to go through the process. Um, so, and I, what I think sometimes people don't appreciate is that once you've got through that and you've got to acceptance, there's still a lot of stuff to do. Um, so then there will be, there will be the revisions, Usually we, we had checked these. If there were major revisions, they might go back to the reviewer to check. That takes time. Um, copy editing, it goes to, to Pauline Kung to be copy edited. And we have a very weird house style as to be put in this <laughs> which I now can't do anything else because I just don't want to do bizarre house style. Then we get proofs which we send to the authors, and we also send to a member of the editorial board, usually me, to, to proofread. And I am always amazed by the number of people who do not proofread their paper. They think it's in proof, I just, I'm, I'm not gonna, it's fine. And then there are, I mean, there might not be big problems, but they, 
Sometimes Arabic, but sometimes their name is spelled wrong, or uh, you know, uh, you know. In the process, lots of files and lots of versions are going back and forth. There's a lot of potential for error. The images can be in the wrong place. They can have the wrong label. There's all kinds of things. And very often, people don't even look. And this, I, and then I look and I send the queries to the author. But I am thinking, don't you care? <laughs> you know. Um, and again, some people are very um, meticulous, which we definitely appreciate. Um, so once that is done, sometimes we ask for second proofs uh, if it's you know really, especially if it's dry critics or, or illustrations or something like that. Um, we usually want is enough, and then we public we can publish it online. Uh, and it comes out in about a week or 10 days. And the benefit of that, as I said, is that you don't have to wait for the slot. So we have three issues a year, usually one or two of those are special issues, so we cannot put general articles in them, so then you've got to wait. So for instance, next the two next uh, issues are special issues, and the next general issue is in November 2018, now. so this may be, you know, you sort of think, well, that's a terribly long time but it will go online now. So for the purposes of, of you know, whatever administrative exercises you need to get, you need the paper for, it's there now, you know, you can download it as far as, far as you know, all of this, because it, it is published. And then there will be a print month issue as well. Um, so that, I think, is basically it. I have no idea what it's time is this. In a minute, I will hand over to Dr. Almakin, but I also wanted to, uh, this is, uh, uh, I was way too much time on Twitter. Um, this is a very funny thing with uh, allegedly real comments sent out by peer reviewers, which, uh, so for the, the pinned one at the top is, I'm afraid this manuscript will contribute not so much toward the field's advancement as much as towards its eventual demise. Um, so there are lots of marvelous things. I mean, I personally have a list of things that people have said about my work where, you know, it's kind of blazed into your memory and you're never going to forget the stuff that people have said to you. So, um, yeah, I mean, it happens to all of us. Uh, and it's been very funny because it's all kind of completely the same. And, I, you know, when I read the report, sometimes there is quite a bit of... Uh, but sometimes it may be deserved. Uh, I remember doing, um, spending a lot of time reviewing a paper that was really not, not that good, but trying to give constructive comments, and then the other reviewer apparently said, I am lost for words, and that was all. <laughs> what the? I mean, he was right, but like, <laughs> like um, lost for words not because it was good, yeah. Um, so anyway, so if you need to cheer yourself up about uh, the comments, I highly recommend this. Um, so maybe uh, we can do um, just a, a few minutes with Dr. Al Makin, um, and then we'll take questions to, to both of us uh, from from all of you. So again, I've been very happy to to welcome Dr. Al Makin because we have just published his his article, and so he can tell you something about about that experience. with the uh, old age. I first published with old age in Journal of uh, Christian Muslim Relation in 2009. And it was very helpful too. And I had another experience with Braille based in Leiden, but it's very tough. So the comments sometimes indeed very nasty, you know. <laughs> they will say poor English. <laughs> it doesn't sound English. <laughs> There's a lot of comments. And I, last year I published uh, my book in Springer. That is helpful, but not as helpful as uh, Malay one. It's very helpful, and I feel very appreciated. Although, you know, I am Indonesian, and you know, my English is not good, you know. Uh, as far as uh, my experience is concerned, to publish in a peer-reviewed journal, 
like uh, Malaywood or Grail, Springer, and in Cambridge. Next year, inshallah, I will publish in Cambridge. Uh, it's about our mentality, you know. It's about uh, our ability to prepare, to accept uh, the comments. Because the comment is not always nice and not always pleasant, and I will say the comment is not always encouraging. Uh, we have to be prepared whatever the comment is. Uh, because, firstly, English is not our language. I learn English. I learn English when I finish my undergraduate. And then I learn German when I finish my uh, master. So it's, it's very struggling for me and also for you. I know I'm Indonesian and I try my best to write in English. <coughs> Uh, the thing is that, uh, because I'm also editor of my journal, which is uh, Journal Al Jamia, when Indonesian writer receive uh, feedback, they do not immediately respond, or they feel their dignity is degraded. That is the problem. They feel, you know, quote unquote, humiliated by the reviewers. Uh, when I receive papers from my journal and then I throw it to the reviewers, the reviewer will say something that is not pleasant and the writer like give up. And I wait like three months, one year, no news at all. And then two years later, okay, okay, I fix my paper, could you please review again? And then I will send it to the reviewer and they will say there is no change at all. <laughs> uh, you cannot deceive reviewer because at the moment even using words, Microsoft words, you can compare two documents. When there is no change, it's exactly no red line. When there is change, there is red line or blue line. Okay, so just be prepared. And when there is a common, when there is common like Mulaika uh, saw us, there are two ways. First, we could defend, as long as we could uh, search for alternative arguments, which is means by uh, studying more, finding new books, or other books, or supporting our argument with the new data coming from our field, if we're doing a research work. Or we just take it easy. Okay, thank you very much, reviewer. I will change as you suggested. And I will, I will choose the second one. That is easier for me. I will try to understand what the reviewers mean and then adjust our arguments. But if it is really important, we want to argue, uh, give a different perspective, we can do that, but a bit hard. You know? I, I, I did both. I did both. But mostly, I will choose, you know, I will need the advices from the reviewers. And the second thing is that our English, that is major problem. So please make sure before we send uh, our papers, uh, find a native speaker or at least those whose English is better than us. Please read our papers, pay if necessary, and that is not much compared to the funding that we receive from our uh, lp 2 <laughs> from our lp 2 Just sacrifice a little bit. Don't consume all the research money to buy a roof or <laughs> fix our window. <laughs> no, no, forget about it. Just buy another money to fix our window or our roof when it's late. Just throw the money or invest something. Invest to editors, invest to buy a ticket to go somewhere to have another experience of doing research. And it's not, not useless. It will have bear fruits. <laughs> okay, uh, two more minutes, so very short. Uh, the same, another thing I will address is our ability to update our literature. Uh, I have studied with uh, many uh, graduate students and also with some lecturers. When they write a paper, they write from the perspective of uh, field work or from the perspective, perspective of manuscript. They do not connect their papers to the existing or updating theories that is already available uh, on air. So please make sure that we use the most recent theory. What I mean by theory is literature. And no, it's very easy. UGM is very rich 
and I admire that. UKM is very rich. They uh, subscribe Scopus, they subscribe Emerald, and so many uh, online journals. Please use this resource. Consult this resource, which uh, paper is the most recent. And please quote and cite or refer. Don't use uh, papers that published in 1980s or 1990s. That is too late. And the reviewers will immediately say, Oh, this guy doesn't read my books. <laughs> if accidentally the reviewers also in the same field and writing new books. So make sure you convince the reviewer that you are really updating your uh, knowledge. And about book, this is a little bit hard when they ask to, re to renew our literature in terms of book. Because book is available in Singapore and that is a bit expensive. We have to travel to Singapore and then buy a book not including the price of the ticket that is quite expensive. <laughs> or we have a new tricks. I will ask my friend abroad, uh, you know, serving as a fellow or a student, please find this book and read it for me and then send the result. <laughs> <laughs> that is good also. <laughs> that is a good trick. Or sometimes, please just take a picture and then send it to me through WhatsApp. That is also a good trick. <laughs> so many ways to trick uh, these shortcomings, particularly if you are OKM, okay, that is fine. But my campus, we subscribed Scopus last year, but this year they drop it because it's too expensive. And I sneak around in OKM and I ask password from my colleagues in OKM. Please give me your password and then I will treat you for lunch. <laughs> okay, uh, English, uh, literature, and then uh, theory, and then structure. In terms of structure, it's also uh, very useful if you ask some colleagues or some friends. So make sure before you submit, uh, your paper is read by uh, two people at least, other than the author, other than us. When I was published in 1999 with, with Braille in a classical journal, because my, my field book is early Islam, it's very classical. Uh, at the time, I was in Canada, and it's very easy for me to find somebody to read my paper. When I send it to Braille, and they will say, this is perfect English, and I was so happy. And I say, thank you, in the footnote, thank you, somebody else, it is my English. That is in 1999, it's a long time ago when I was doing my MA. But after that, I always, not always in the English country. Sometimes I return to Indonesia, sometimes in Australia, sometimes in Germany. Even in Germany, it's very difficult to find somebody who could speak uh, English very well, to write English very well. So I sent to some of my friends. But in the last case, with my publication, don't be honest. <laughs> so please forgive me. I don't let somebody else read my paper first. I just send it. <laughs> uh, because I was busy, you know, with the other duties of administration. We are lecturers in Indonesia. So many duties that is not rational. So many <laughs> not really, really productive. And I just said it, and I did my best. <laughs> I did my best, and then I sent it, and it was great. It's very helpful. Malay word is the best. They're very kind and very generous in advising our English, and also other other journal uh, published by Rodney is also very helpful compared to other publishers like Cambridge or uh, Brill. That is, you know, we could say very mean <laughs> because. When the paper is sent, and then they will say reject it, and there is additional additional comment. The English is very good; it doesn't sound yeah. English. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much again. And this is my talk. So maybe if I just say a few, a few words, sure, sure. Also, and then we can open up for questions. So first of all, thank you very much. And and uh, uh, you know, I, I didn't pay you to say all those nice things. So a couple of points on, on, the, on the language issue uh, and the mention of Germans now. And so it is not just Southeast Asians who have it faces problems. We have published special issues with lots of German authors, and actually, to be honest, it's worse <laughs> than dealing with the authors of first language in Indonesia because they think that it's okay, but it's not okay, and then you've got to kind of rewrite the whole thing. Um, so yeah, so definitely, you know, uh, ask someone if you can, or, or if there are resources available to you to, to spend money. I mean, hopefully you're not spending your own money on it, and you fix your roof if it's leaking. Uh, but, um, you know, but also don't ideally ask another 
someone who's familiar with academic English, because sometimes we see things where, okay, it might be, might have been read by a native speaker, but if it's just a kind of random person who, who, who doesn't read academic work, then it's probably not that helpful. So if you have colleagues or you know friends at other universities or who are here visiting or something like that, you ask them. Uh, but I, I noticed that you know most of, of all the papers that I've been sent to read, the standard of English was was pretty good. So whoever is uh, editing that for you is is is, um, is doing a good job. Um, for us, I think it's more important about this, the content of the papers, the structure, the organisation of the ideas, and what is in it than the English. So if it's possible to see that it's a good paper in terms of content, we are able to put resources into getting someone to help you and not have you pay for it. Um, so we will pay um, an editor, so a so copy editor, to, to go over it. If, it, if the content is strong enough. For, for us, I think the bigger problem is if, you know, it's, it, it's, it's fairly easy to just kind of go through and fix line by line all the English. It is much more difficult to reorganize a paper where the ideas are not presented in a coherent fashion or, you know, it's not a logical argument or things about it. I mean, that is much more difficult and we can't really do that usually. So for us, if it seems like the, 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 say the field work is very good and it has all the you know, it, it does make reference to you know current issues and current publications, and the English is not so good. Well, that, that's not such a big problem for us. For other people, for other journals, it may well be. Um, okay, so maybe uh, questions from anybody to, to either of us. Not the whole. Uh, well, we do special issues. So if you have a panel on some topic, it's possible to propose a special issue. Uh, and yeah, so, so we do that often. But we don't do like you know proceedings as such. So and then uh, this also has to go through peer review and all of this. Um, but it can be a good uh, good way. So my she was talking about it yesterday. You can do uh, we. We get a lot of proposals for special issues. We try to do two or, or three a year. Um, the, from our perspective, the problem with them is that they can collapse at the last. You know, everybody has to be on board. Uh, you know, you need you need about eight papers for a special issue. It has to go through peer review. If two people drop out and then two people don't pass peer review, then you don't have a special issue anymore. And that's okay. Actually, it's okay for us because we can just publish it together as a cluster, which we do. But sometimes the editor will, the, the guest editor of the special issue is like, well, it's not a special issue and I don't want to do it. And then you just, you know, don't. Yeah, but we do. We do. And we have lots of lots of coming up. Yeah. Okay. Another question. Um, because I'm, I'm also uh, working with a journal uh, here in the uh, UK. Um, we are trying very hardly to, to find uh, good articles to be published in our journal. So um, based on your experience, how do you uh, maintain the quality of the papers? Um, because you said that it's a little bit difficult to find um, uh, reviewers, uh, good reviewers to, to review you. Articles and um, I think in, in, in other journals also have the same problem. But then, how do you um, yeah, maintain the quality? Uh, because uh, uh, our journal has has um, more than 100 um, articles per year. Uh, 100 like last year we received 130 something uh, manuscripts. But uh, unfortunately. Uh, the quality of the articles are very bad, but then we have problem with uh, selecting the papers. So sometimes we we uh, we think that it's a um, little bit um, the finding to uh, send the articles to the to the reviewers because the, the review the reviewers will immediately reject the papers. 
and I mean, it's, yeah. it's difficult to find how to receive a good um, paper. How many and papers do you publish in a year? Um, three, ah, sorry, 30 uh, papers. Uh, so we, because we, uh, in each uh, edition, we publish 10 articles, so we have three editions, three volumes over a year. Yeah, it's difficult actually. I mean, it's very, it's so you might get, so we get something like that number, uh, maybe 100, I don't know, I mean, 50 submissions, but most of, most of them are rejected straight away. And so even though we get a lot of submissions, we are struggling for content. And every time the deadline, print deadline is coming, and we're looking yeah. desperately for it. Yeah. And goes like, do we have enough? Uh, so yeah, how, how do we, yeah. I mean, yeah. if you've been going for a long time, I guess, then you have a, yeah. back, some people have a backlog. Have the we, we recently had an issue where we had everything lined up for months, which was great. But yeah, it's or, a struggle yeah. to find. Do you like, I mean, um, asking someone, like a, a special person to submit his or paper in your journal in order to be yeah, made a body mean, of the... Uh, we, it's possible to do that. I mean, certainly at conferences, you can go around saying, oh, you know, this was a really interesting panel. Like, if you get the papers together, we would be interested in publishing it. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe... I was going to say, I mean, the Journal of Southeast Asian Studies faces this too, um, content. And and we haven't done anything about it, so we decided to go after the papers, and that means investing and in going into conferences. Um, Singapore does host a lot of, of small workshops and events, so that means spending more time of our own time to go to these events and actually speaking to some of the authors who think that are going to do publishing very interesting or working on interesting topics. Um, and so part of it is going after the content, but also generating the content. Mm -hmm. We've also realized that um, we probably need to figure out how to maybe host a workshop or host a conference to, to generate this so that we can create the content and almost, not dictate, but we can provide if we, for instance, if we're having, if we're having we want particular types of papers, we can actually say that in order to submit this paper, it has to meet these sorts of questions or focus on these sorts of issues or whatever, um, so that the, the outcome is something that's a standard thing that can be considered. So that's another way to But you brought up something that's very interesting beforehand about the referees, um, and that is something that we're trying to think about too, because we often get you know, from presentations on the referees process, we're also finding very disparate <coughs> types of reviews coming to us. And so what we specifically do, are now doing is asking much more specific questions. Um, and, and if we don't get an answer, we'll, we'll email back, could you actually follow up on this issue here? Yeah. So that means, of course, more editorial oversight of us, which means, of course, more work. Um, but it, what it will help us do is it will help us also uh, decide to give a better decision, you know, and also help the author on um, the feedback. So for instance, many writers um, don't situate their work within the field so that the authors, or so the readers of our journal, they say, well, why is this important to me if I'm from Cambodia and this is about Indonesia? And so we want to be able to at least some sentence or something to address why this is important to a wider readership. If the referee doesn't point that out, it, uh, then the, the author's not going to point it out, you know, and so we try to incorporate, so we try to manage both the review process um, as well as the author's review, uh, revision process. So I think that's important. But it's a lot of work to do. It's a lot of work to do, and we're truly, we're, we're truly, we're trying to systematize it, and we're not sure how to do it. So we're sort of trying to figure it out, but what's actually very interesting from three journal perspectives is that we all have similar issues here, which is why I'm thinking we should be building a consortium of, of journals of Southeast Asia. And so we have a common database of reviews, of reviewers. And, and that way we can all go into it. I saw this now, but I mean, we have a common database of reviewers. Um, then we can all access it, you know, and say, oh, maybe we can approach these people who work on such and such. And now another trick we also do is if we recently published authors 
then I asked them for a review. Then we asked them for a review. <laughs> <laughs> well, but you know, you, the thing yeah. is that, uh, yeah, and actually, I would like also not just to have more authors from Southeast Asia, but more reviewers. Yeah. Because at the moment, we we have some, and mm -hmm. I, we do try to, to ask our you know recent authors. But because, you know, you don't, you need to know the person a little bit, mm -hmm. actually. You need to know they're not going to send you a really crazy review because then you, you can't just get rid of it you know you're like the, the process is you have received this review you have to deal with it you can't just be like oh. um but you know you can get reviews which are just you think actually no i cannot pass this on and right. you clearly have to show about something and i just or you had a bad day or something like this uh so it's important to have personal connection i think um so but yeah, it would be great if we widened the pool a little bit, or a lot. Um, not just of authors, but of reviewers as well. Well, I, I'm, uh, I'm wondering about the uh, uh, specific things. I have gone through the issues of Indonesian matter world and found out some articles uh, on a very uh, linguistic thing, like some complexities of the Malays circumflex ke and an, yeah. which is uh, exactly kind of a uh, focus of most of our colleagues who work on linguistics. Yeah. And also, I found out articles on the Japanese suffix ne, yeah. which is very, very specific. And I'm just wondering in how far Indonesia and the Malay world can accommodate this type of uh, articles, which is very, you know, very, uh, which, which is gone to the specialist. Specialist is fine. Yeah, specialist is fine. I mean, we have struggled with linguistics papers recently because we can't get reviewers. So maybe we need to increase our reviewer pool. Um, so, so we recently uh, published uh, uh, the paper by uh, Ryan Arka, uh, but we hadn't published linguistics for quite. I think those two articles that you mentioned are from a while yes, ago. Yes, yeah. yeah. So the, the Mayan Arca one is quite recent, but it took a very long time to review. Mm. So it's not that I, I mean, I would like to publish more and it's within the remit, but it took a year or something to, just because we couldn't get any reviewers. And I, you know, so uh, that, I mean, it wasn't that the, the reviews, but it's just, we asked this person, they said, no, then you've got to find another review. It really took a long time. So, in a way I wanted, because if you're in linguistics, you can go for disciplinary journals, and would you get a faster turnaround and a better response? I don't know. I mean, we can certainly try it. So if we send the linguistic articles, we will try our best to to find uh, to find reviewers. And, and, but specific is fine. Yeah, we have some very, very specific papers. Uh, so recently, we published um, uh, so we have a young, oh yes, I should, one thing I should mention is we have a young scholars competition. Uh, and uh, so this is for sort of uh, recent PhDs or emerging scholars. We run it every two years. Uh, there's a small prize attached to it, but mainly you get published and then they say this is the winner's prize. Uh, so um, so the, this um, article by Yeri Yakul on the left, Black Africans on the Maritime Silk Group, was a runner-up for the prize, and that is so <laughs> arcane. I mean, well, it's very interesting. It's about uh, African slaves in, you know, pre-modern Southeast Asia. The data set is quite small, right? Because there's really not very much. It's a little bit epigraphic, and then there's some, some literary evidence. It's a very small data set, but it's a very interesting topic. So, uh, you know, the thing is part of the Actually, I want to get specifically 
Yeah, so we do, we have the websites on the channel of this thing, and uh, MLOs, okay. Um, so if you Google it, you'll find it. Uh, we have the instructions for authors, which everybody ignores, but like, please, please look at that, please. Um, and yeah, so it also gives you editorial board, which is quite interesting, you know, as we talked about yesterday, it's worth having a look at it and thinking about are these people who you read, uh, who you're, whose work you're interested in, you know, do you fit there, or is it all people who do stuff that you don't care about, and so maybe, because the editorial board is the first port of call for our reviewers, um, for, for us to find reviewers, and then, you know, other people, so, um, yeah, so you can kind of, you know, judge uh, whether it's a good fit for you, um, and it also gives you, um, you know, how to submit and, and things like that. And also, you can, and so I think you have a subscription to this Agatomada, so you can have a look at, you know, what's, what is out, what is in there, but I'm not logged in at the moment. I mean, one, one thing that I really would um, recommend is, yeah, so, so following up on, on, on what Amakin was saying about but literature review and situating your paper, do have a look around at what's come out recently. And you know, so if we did, I received a paper recently on, you know, quite an arcane topic. It was, uh, it was about the Johor, Johor Constitution, the Sultanate of Johor's Constitution in 1897 or something in its introduction. And nowhere in it did it mention the article that we published on this topic three years ago. <laughs> So I thought, well, okay, I mean, you didn't read it, you didn't do a literature review, I got what I, you know, I can't, I can't I'm not going to send it for a review because it, this person hasn't, hasn't searched for any other, I mean, you take your five minutes, um, and you don't have to agree with it, right, you don't have to agree with the article that we published, uh, but you have to know that it's there, and you have to show that you know that it's there, and I think one thing maybe, one, I have mentioned it to, to some people, but maybe it's worth mentioning again, is that in your literature review, you, you know, if you disagree with the previous work, that's good, actually. <laughs> yeah, so maybe we all want to be quite non-confrontational, especially about, you know, established people in the field or whatever, and you just want to kind of name check them and be like, oh, yes, so and so is written on there. But if findings uh, challenge what they have done, then that's, Good, and you should say so, so that we know why this article is important. Because you have a new perspective, or you have, you know, you're, you're challenging the model, or whatever. If you don't say so, and sometimes I, it seems to me that the author doesn't want to make it obvious that they're disagreeing or something like that, then you know, yeah. I mean, it's an opportunity. I mean, and it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be confrontational. It doesn't have to be uh, aggressive. You know, it's like we're all trying to move the field a little bit at a time, and this is part of it. You say, well, so-and-so argued this before, now my, what I've done shows that actually maybe it's something slightly different. And that's, that's absolutely, well, that's a good thing to do, actually. So you can come and scroll. Yeah, I, I would say something about Cambridge. Yeah. We have a Cambridge group, <laughs> but we're also developing, um, by December, a separate web page with website, actually, for our journal because um, we don't have a very good web presence. And we're sort hidden within the Department of History under their publications. I think it's very hard to find information, but if you go to the Cambridge Core, you can find something like what we have here with access to it, um, which is some more recent articles, citations. I just want to know a little bit about your relationship with the great Taylor Tanks, but what is it? What, what is it? Is there authority for this? Are you operating on great German papers? No, no, so they have nothing to do with the editorial process. They don't care, right? They do not care. They just want to make money, yes. Uh, 
so yeah, the, the, so you know, Santa Francis has just absolutely no interest in, in what we're doing or what we're doing, you know, and, and that's good. <laughs> um, they just uh, give us the, the world to check, and what well, you know, they, they have a website, they distribute, you know, they, they put it to typesetting and all of that, and they distribute, so they do all the kind of nuts and bolts stuff, but we prepare the content. Um, and to do all the review stuff, and they just they they're just interested in the product, you know, really like a product that they're selling, and it, they have absolutely no interest in, in what's in it. I mean, this is they're, they're in sales, basically. They're sales, yeah. They want the production yeah. of the actual thing, and uh, and distribution and the sales, and we're packaged. I mean, what it's meant for us is that we have some revenue. If we were just a SOAS journal, we have no distribution and we have no money. Uh, so here we have a tiny amount of money, and they do all the distributing and marketing and blah blah blah, and they package it with all these other Asian studies journals that sell it, you know, around the world. So you get it with however many other titles, you know, when you buy it. But yeah, it's a, uh, and they, they keep pushing us to be more and more kind of uh, sort of streamlined. Like they want us to do online submission have an automated system, or we don't want to do it because we think that our reviewers and our reviewers will not like it. Uh, so, you know, all of this stuff. But um, yeah, but they don't, so that whole thing with Taylor and Francis and that third world quarterly, I mean, that's probably like their worst nightmare. Um, they would have had nothing to do with it. They would have just been like, oh, PR disaster, you know? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't know whether it's different from Cambridge, maybe they're a bit more, a bit, a bit more like, about, about, the, or about, you know, how they handle the, or, or your relationship with them? Yeah, ours is very similar. I mean, they they are in it for the money. They also bundle their, their articles, and, you know, our, our journals with others. Um, they'll check in once in a while just to tell us some developments. You know, they give us a lot of metrics. Though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but in terms of in, uh, in terms of actual the sort of intellectual aspect of it, they have no intervention whatsoever. You know, um, and that's. That's, that's good. So if you're dealing with co colleagues you're dealing with colleagues, you send it to either of our journals. You know, folks who understand, we feel your pain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel your pain. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I guess they have to, I think what they don't want us to do is things like that, that work quarterly, or, right. you know, big ethical problems which occur more in science, you know, STEM subjects. Right. But if you don't want us to do this, those kinds of things, because it is terrible for your animal suits and what have you. Uh, but other than that, they, don't, they just don't care. Right version, 
but also explain to the editor so the editor knows that you are dealing with the issue. You know, I think I think it's also very helpful. So in both the both the response as well as in the, yeah. in the essay itself. Because so you know, it, it's a query, it's a question, it's not a. You have to do this, yeah. right? right. Um, and sometimes the queries are like, oh, have you thought about this issue? And yeah, you thought about it, but there's no data. But they don't know there's no data, right? But you know. So you say, well, I thought about it, but there's no data. And the editor may not know. Also. And the editor probably doesn't know. Yeah, so that's why it's important to respond to the editor. Like, I think it's terrific practice to do with the wonderful example <laughs> I say that where you go know. through each issue and, and, and say what you will do in response to that comment. Because a lot of times the editor may not be an expert on that particular topic. So we need to, need to know what are you going to do with that, about that topic or what that, with that, that comment. And if you give a reasonable explanation as to why you don't want to, to do it, that helps us a lot in making the decisions. So we can act as mediator, actually, between the referees and the authors. And we, we you know, depending on the issue, we can say, okay, great, or sometimes we need follow up. Maybe, I know it's probably copyright time, but one more question. Okay, thank you very much. Very generic, but if you would like to to uh, take one, please feel free. And you know, this flyer has their Asian studies things, and also shameless plug for SOAS. Um, if some of you may know about the Alpha Wood Scholarship that's being offered at SOAS for Hindu Buddhist art of antiquity, <laughs> there are lots of scholarships. So if you are that happen to be doing this very <laughs> well, it's not a niche topic, but you know, uh, Hindu Buddhist art of antiquity do consider applying because the application season is coming up and uh, it's a very generous uh, scholarship and uh, it's a So please take a flyer. If you or anyone you know would like to apply for it, or come and talk to me and ask me about it afterwards. Okay, thank you.